Well, Francisco, we're having a retrospective conversation about Momotombo Press. Indeed. And um, the work we're going to discuss spans uh, an inception of 2000 and an actual realization of the year 2001, all the way through to the last publication date. 2009. To 2009. And here we are in 2013, looking back on a, basically a 10... Ten, I'd say 10 years. Yeah, around 10 years total effort um, of a, a press that was born out of our time together at UC Davis. Momotombo Press, um, which I should probably start by saying something about the name of the press. Uh, Momotombo Press, the name was inspired by the volcano in Nicaragua uh, called Momotombo. And uh, I wanted to sort of infuse a bit of Nicaraguanness into the, the gesture. And why is that? <clears throat> because I'm throwing you a softball. <laughs> <laughs> because my, 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 my parents came to California in the late 50s from Nicaragua, mm. so I'm of Nicaraguan origin. So Momotombo, the volcano in Nicaragua, became the, the talisman. Exactly. And the name. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. So do you want to tell um, our audience of the future about what were some of the things that inspired you to start a press in the first place? Well, I think what would be useful is for us to sort of talk about the context. Uh -huh. First of all, how we met and where we were when the press was started. Right. We were both at UC Davis in 1998. Just as young and cute as we are now. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, um, well, one of the things I often say when asked about what inspired the press is I talk about... Um, even before we talk about what happened at Davis, the experience of being published in the Chicano Chatbook series mm -hmm. with Gary Soto, yeah. which which did happen in, in 1999 while I was at UC Davis. And that was light yogurt, strawberry milk. Was that your chapbook? Yeah, yeah, yeah light yogurt, strawberry milk. Um, Gary, uh, as you may know, uh, was the founder and editor of the Chicano Chatbook series, which had two waves, mm -hmm. one in the late 70s, which included such people as uh, Sandra Cisneros, mm -hmm. Alberto Rios, uh, and others. And then he interrupted the series and restarted it in the late 90s. And in the second wave of the series, he included such writers as Rigoberto Gonzalez, Richard Yanez, myself, John Olivares Espinosa. So this is late 90s <laughs> for the most part? Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. One of the things about the, and then shortly after he did my chat book, um, he, he stopped. Mm -hmm. He decided that the gesture had been done. And so there was a vacuum. Mm -hmm. There was a vacuum. So I think that vacuum, coupled with our small press experiences at UC Davis, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is what created the fertile ground mm -hmm. to start something, such as when we were in the class with Sandra McPherson. In fact, you can talk, I'd be interested to know the, about Swanside Press because that was such a, I think, a, an important part of this, this yeah. incipient story. Sure, sure. They have a kind of a twin genesis in a way, yeah. Swanside Press and Momotombo Press. And that my memories of our time at UC Davis are in both Gary Snyder's classes and Senator McPherson's classes, they would bring in, um, you know, old boxes just loaded with this material richness, chapbooks from the 70s, from the 60s, from the 80s. Um, chapbook after chapbook that they had been collecting over the years to sort of represent this kind of homegrown yet, um, you know, highly artisanal yeah. um, tradition in publishing. Um, and so at one point, I, um, Sandra McPherson was my thesis advisor, and she was known to say, I wish I could start a press. Someone should start a press. There are so many good poets out there who are struggling to be published. Um, and so one day I said to her, well, let's do it. Let's start a press. I said, you get me a graduate assistantship and, and I'll work for you to launch a press. And so she said, oh, okay. <laughs> so uh, she secured a, a one semester assistantship for me and, and we founded Swanside Press, which had a, a mission to publish exclusively poetry at that time. Mm -hmm. And um, that So that was, was before the prize? Before yes. Before the Swanside Yeah, the Swan then, it, then it launched a poetry chapbook prize. Which was where we had the class, I think. There was also the class. Eventually, yeah, yeah, eventually having the press bond, a, a small press publishing class where graduate students all had a hand, hands-on experience running the contest, selecting the winner. And I was in that class, remember? Yes, right, yeah. right. Yeah. Meanwhile, as Sandy McPherson and I are forming Swanside, meanwhile, 
across town <laughs> in the mind of Francisco Aragon. <laughs> well, the experience, so the experience of having my chapbook published with Gary Soto, um, continuing that story, having the physical chapbook in hand, you know, having something in hand became like a calling card. Mm -hmm. And I remember that a number of the poems from the chapbook went on to get uh, published in a number of anthologies. In fact, in some ways, I'm actually it, at this institution because of that chapbook. Mm. Because um, when it was published, it occurred to me to ask if I could give a reading at the uh, conference of the uh, no the Knox Conference in Portland, Oregon, mm. in the spring. Knox of, being Knox being National Association of Chicana and Chicano Studies. So it was having that chapbook, which landed me a reading at the Knox Conference mm. in Portland. Oh, no kidding. Which is how I met uh, Gil Cardenas. Oh, okay. And yeah. Gil Cardenas was the director here at... He was the founding director of the Institute for Latino Studies. Yeah. yeah. So having that chapbook was really empowering. Yeah. And when it shut down, when, when the Chicano chapbook s series shut down, I remember thinking uh, that it would be nice to do that for my peers. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to say at this point that the first iteration of Momotombo Press was not a Latino-centric project. Mm -hmm. Mark my words. <laughs> Five emerging poets. And as you can see, the people who were published in the first, uh, in the inaugural volume mm -hmm. of Momotombo Press were all people who were pursuing uh, MAs at UC Davis. Mm -hmm. You know, the Momotombo ended up with a mission to publish Latino poets, and as you say, this this first volume, though, didn't necessarily have that emphasis, but you came out of the tradition of the Chicano Chapbook series, and I remember when you approached me to be in this um, edition, I was lucky enough to be one of your five, and you said, um, I've decided I'm publishing five poets from the program, and I would like two of them to be Latinas. And that was part of your early vision. You were very... Um, I don't remember saying that. Please, you were very pleased that you could have a 40% um, Latina <laughs> representation in your first volume. You and so that would be Angela Garcia is the other poet. I was just trying to think, uh, one of the other things that I remember about, about the press um, that sort of distinguished it from the Chicano Chapbook series was this idea of having more established writers write the brief introductions. Yes. But I don't remember why I decided to do that. You had a model, and I don't remember what it was either. <laughs> you had a model. We had seen somewhere where that had happened. I think it was Penny Whistle Press. Oh, okay. Uh, and Francisco Alarcón had published in that press. And I believe that Juan Felipe Herrera... Uh, may have written, but that would be peer to peer, not established. Yeah, peer. not established as a mentoring gesture. Yeah. 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 I'm. I don't recall. I think you had a model. <laughs> I don't remember what it was. Well, as as one of the first authors, as one of the first authors in in the in the in the, in the series, yeah. do you have any recollections about the process of how that? Well, I think that you had copies of the nearly the entire thesis manuscript for each of those folks, mm -hmm. and that you made selections. I don't remember particularly suggesting one poem over another. I think you you applied a sense of vision or a sense of unity or extracting something from each poet. That I do recall, now that you mention it, in my introduction, that I basically culled a chapbook length uh -huh. manuscript from each thesis, basically. From, from your thesis, yeah, basically. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that was an interesting effort. And of course, completely gratifying for me to see what other readers responded to, to see what you responded to as an editor. Um, were you were you trying to kind of distill a representative um, bit from <clears throat> each one, or did you look I for think more thematic? There was a combination of that, but also, and this is getting back to the context specifically, um, it wasn't until taking Sandra McPherson's class, which was the occasion for that prize, uh -huh. when, when they did this one side press uh -huh. prize, that I began to think of the chapbook as this sort of coherent whole. Uh -huh. And I remember that when we were reading and critiquing the contest entries, we would have discussions about manuscripts that had very strong poetry in them, mm -hmm. 
but that somehow didn't add up, weren't cohering yeah. in a satisfying way. Right, right. And so I think that was part of the thinking that went into choosing the poems that I chose, mm -hmm. um, whether or not readers, um, you know, that leave it up to readers to decide if, if in fact they, they cohered in that way. But I remember I was thinking that as a direct result uh -huh. of, of being in, in, in Sandra's So class. you were kind of seeking a kind of aesthetic unity, or if not unity, maybe that's overstating it, but a kind of aesthetic relationship within each poet's work. A kind of, this would be the Lisa Sperber chapbook-like unit, and yeah. this would be the Sean McDonald chapbook-like unit, yeah. Maybe we should say for the sake of the record that the five authors who were in the inaugural volume were Lisa Sperber, Sean McDonald, Angela Garcia, Eric Goodis, and, and yourself. And I should also mention that Eric Goodis was the person who handled the book design. For that volume? And I think... I didn't remember that. Yeah, he did He did the book design uh -huh. and then the formatting. Oh, interesting. Um, for, the, for this volume. And he was a graduate student with us at the yeah. time. And I think this might be a good time to talk a little bit about the influence, because I do remember it had an influence uh, of being in Gary Snyder's workshop and what he had to say about small press publishing. Right. And what I took away from his influence was the notion of two things, starting small mm -hmm. on a modest scale, mm -hmm. which might include even self-publishing a chapbook, mm -hmm. and starting and putting that work out for your immediate community. Yes. For your immediate community, which might even be, you know, just to give away to your friends. That's right. Um, do you remember? Do you remember? That? That's true. He did emphasize that sense of um, sort of cultivating the audience that was literally at hand, you know, down the street, the the cafes in your neighborhood. Um, and was so was this a three hundred copy or five hundred copy? I think it was five hundred edition. Copies. I think yeah. that it was. And I think I even mentioned. In fact, I think I even mentioned the very. Yeah, the very, in the very first sentence, in the spring of 1999, Gary Snyder devoted a session in his poetry workshop at Small Press Publishing, sharing with the students how Rip Rap first got into print. Oh, yeah. And so I remember him mm. using that as an example, that here was a Rip Rap, which mm -hmm. was a tiny, small press, limited edition run, and it wasn't until later that it had its own sort of trade, mm -hmm. trade publishing yeah. iteration. Oh, okay. Yeah. I had forgotten that story of his. I think what I took away from his class was the sense of the poetry world as being really a DIY kind of place, really a do-it-yourself kind of place, and that um, that the role of the poet includes audience cultivation and um, experiments with the actual material production of, of work. Um, some students were taking a bookmaking class at that yeah. time. There was just kind of an atmosphere in our cohort of um, sort of taking the reins of the entire process of creation and dissemination. And I think another instrumental experience that also involves Gary was the class, I think you were in that class, the class that we took on the San Francisco Renaissance. Right. And I remember for that class, my semester project was Jack Spicer. And so I read uh, Poet Be Like God, his mm. biography, and read through all his work. And anyone who's familiar with Jack Spicer's biography knows that all his books were published in the small press, mm -hmm. white, white rabbit press, and mm -hmm. he insisted that they be published by small local presses. Mm -hmm. and he was actually very adamant about not being published mm -hmm. in presses that had wide distribution. Mm -hmm. He wanted them published in small local presses. Huh. So I remember that uh, caused a great impact, the idea yeah. of someone of Jack Spicer's stature wanting to start do something really small. And to stick with it as yeah. his practice. And there were other things happen, con happening concurrently, which I've mentioned in, in some of the prefaces over, over the course of the, of, the, of the titles. There was um, the Berkeley poet Jim Powell, who was a graduate student at UC Berkeley when I was an undergrad, and who had won a MacArthur mm -hmm. Fellow and Fellowship and had published a book with the University of Chicago Press and had published his Sappho translations with Farrar Strauss. Mm -hmm. And then he won the MacArthur. And then he decided to publish, self-publish, these uh, chapbooks mm -hmm. of his, which he called, he called them, uh, wrote, wrote it down here, Sage 
where does it, where is it? And Pennyroyal? Yeah, Sage and Pennyroyal. Uh -huh. And I remember um, they were very modestly produced. Uh -huh. And he would sell them for like fifteen dollars, and his his rationale was that this is that that's what it cost to buy a CD of music at that time. And oh, so okay. That was his CD. Oh. <laughs> and I remember being struck by the whole notion that if a if Great a rationale. MacArthur fellow can self publish his chat book and sell it for fifteen dollars, then why can't we do something like yeah. that on a small scale as well? Yeah, so this is a little bit off book, off of our cheat sheet here, but um, I, I am interested in that relationship between um, self-publishing and small press publishing um, as, as kind of distinct but maybe cousin efforts. And meanwhile, at, this t at the time that you're starting your, your work as an editor and a publisher, you also are continuing to send your own work out, you're pulling together your own next book at that time. Um, so what, did you ever feel any tension between those two activities? Did you ever think, if I wasn't doing so much darn editing, I could get more writing done? Or, or did you feel they were complementary efforts? Um, it goes back and forth. Uh -huh. I think over time, as I got more and more engaged with the editing and the publishing aspect of the field, which necessarily takes time away from right. cultivating your own art making, I sort of reconciled myself to the notion of um, that that activity was just a complementary or supplementary activity. I remember Eric Goodis made a very flattering remark uh, when we launched uh, Mark My Words and he brought up the example of James Laughlin mm. at New Directions. Mm. You know, James Laughlin started New Directions yeah. with money he inherited from his father and that became a Good, good part of his identity mm -hmm. as the publisher of New Directions, yeah. but then he was also a poet himself. Uh -huh. so, so you found that so a, that was sort of a became, good model. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. And in terms of self-publishing or small press publishing, uh, I was engaged with both notions, and I put down on the cheat sheet because I remember um, Thomas Kinsella in Ireland had Pepper Canister mm. Press, mm. which would be his own work in sort of chat book increments mm -hmm. that he would self-publish mm -hmm. and you could find them in bookstores yeah. uh, and then eventually they would become you know a, a book but they'd start off as, as these self-published chat uh -huh. books. Huh. Yeah. Interesting, interesting, yeah so they are related, related efforts. Um, do you want to talk any more about some of these influences otherwise I have some more questions. <laughs> sure. So um, I think that it might be interesting to hear about the actual um, flow of money and materials <laughs> in terms of generating these and how that shifted over time with your institutional affiliation changing. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, the, the way Momotomo Press got started, money-wise, uh, was pretty straightforward and I had no idea what I was doing. Um, but in essence, I put together a proposal which included writing samples from the five of you. Mm -hmm. uh, and the proposal may have been about a page. And I sent that proposal, hard copy, mailed it to, th let's call it 30 people who I would describe as family and friends. Mm -hmm. And very specific, I asked, uh, I, I described the project, and I asked for anywhere between $50 and $300. Mm -hmm. So I actually put a ceiling on it, uh -huh. and uh, and from that first gesture, I raised roughly, I raised about six thousand dollars. Wow! And so that pretty much nice that friends bankrolled <laughs> bankrolled the first two volumes. Uh -huh. uh, uh, Mark my words. Oh, and, okay, and, and, it covered and, both. It covered covered Mark my words, and it covered a uh, volume two, which was the land of give and take. Oh, right, by Christopher Chris Sint. Yeah. And what I remember about that experience, because it was my first foray into fundraising. Uh, there were two things I remember. One thing is that, um, which shows how little I knew about fundraising, because in my pitch letter I said, I'm not going to ask you for money, I'm only going to ask you this one time, <laughs> which of course... You never you would, <laughs> would say again yeah. in the rest of your fundraising career. Yeah. Yes, right. And the second thing that was interesting is that even as I was going down the list of people, I sort of in my own mind would have a little guesstimate of how much this person would give, uh -huh. how much this person would uh -huh. give, and I would think, oh, this person's going to give me 300, mm -hmm. this person's going to give me 50, mm -hmm. this person's going to give me 100. And I was correct about 50% of the time. Mm. 
And so there were people who I thought were good for 50 who gave me 300. How about that? People who I thought were good for 300 who gave me 50. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it began to sort of, it was really interesting to see uh -huh. that. And one person ignored my ceiling and just gave me 500. Uh-huh. Yeah. Wow. And the other thing I remember uh, about that experience, which I did take with me as I began to raise money for other projects, was that there were a number of people who explicitly thanked me. Mm -hmm thanked me for inviting them mm -hmm. to be a part of this mm -hmm. project. And so they didn't really view it as me hitting them up for money right. as much as me inviting, inviting them. them to become part of something special. Yeah. Which I hadn't, which, which is a really good lesson. It is such an important distinction that, um, that, that the Momotomo supporters can be proud of, you know, promoting literature in this way. And, and as you say, that it's not necessarily... Um, a matter of a begging bowl as, a, yeah. as it is an invitation. Yeah. yeah, 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 interesting. Okay, so um, should we start moving through the titles? And, and sure. as we so do, you can sort of describe the evol evolution of your institutional affiliation. You're still at Davis when this one comes out, right? I'm actually... Or are you in Spain? No, when, when, so Chris, well, we should say something about, about Christopher Sint. Christopher Sint was a graduate student at UC Davis. In literature. In literature, though I think he had done the MA and then he went, that's right, that's went, right. went he into had the stayed PhD on. program. Yep. And the interesting thing about him is that I think shortly after uh, his book came out, he went to St. Mary's, and I'll tell you why that's important in a minute. But, but actually, I think Chris, Christopher's book came out shortly after I got to Notre Dame to start my MFA, oh, okay. which would have been the fall of 2001. Oh, okay. Yeah. Hmm. And I, I, I should say that, um, just to give credit where credit is due, his book was designed and formatted by Lisa Gonzalez, oh, who no went kidding. on to become a Momotoba Press author uh -huh. after it became Latino centric. Right, right. And just for the sake of documentation, I think we before we should also just mention who the, the we should probably say who who, who introduced who, each one. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So you were introduced by Gary Snyder, Gary Snyder. My, men, my mentor, one of my mentors. And uh, Sean McDonald was introduced by Bruce Weigel. Eric Goodis was introduced by Jack Marshall. Lisa Sperber was introduced by Alan Williamson. And Angela Garcia was introduced by Robert Vasquez, and of course that's significant because Robert was the inaugural judge of the Andres Montoya Poetry mm -hmm. Prize. Right, and only two of those are on the faculty at UC Davis, so you, you pull from poets all in all throughout California, basically. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and Christopher's chat book was introduced by, by Brenda Hillman and blurbed by Michael Palmer and Jane Hirschfield. Mm -hmm. I remember him telling me when he, when he, when he found out that I landed the, the two blurbs with Jane Hirschfield, and Michael Palmer, and when Brenda Hillman had said yes, he goes, I can die now. <laughs> yes, that, he was, that, was, that would be California poetry nirvana. <laughs> the reason why I bring up uh, Christopher Sitton, how important he was, is because shortly after that book came out, he began teaching at St. Mary's College in Moraga, and I knew that in order to sustain the press, and at least in the beginning, I thought, well, at some point, I'd like to have access to grant money. Mm -hmm. And in order to do that, I would need an institutional affiliation. And so oh. what happened was that Momotomo Press, there, for a brief it? period of yeah. time, was officially housed at St. Mary's College in I forgot in about that phase. That's right. In yeah. Kristen's office, essentially, right? He, uh, by having it housed there, um, when I began to fundraise for subsequent titles, Checks would be made out to St. Mary's uh -huh, College. Uh -huh. So he set up an account huh. for us. To be a fiscal agent. Yeah. yeah. And the titles that were published during that iteration would include uh, our other Davis colleague, Wednesday Carlton. Who, was she living in France when that one came out? I think she may have already moved to but France. But she graduated with us at yeah. UC Davis, yeah. Yeah. And then um, Kathy Garlick chat book, The Listening World, with a wonderful introduction by Adam Zakajewski. Uh, Adam Zakajewski introduced uh, her book. She was a student at Houston, mm. and she was a friend of Eric Goodis, and she was trying to get work published, oh, and she wasn't getting it. So it's, this was sort of this this title was curated by Eric, oh, that's and also designed by Eric. Huh? Yeah. How interesting. And Wednesday's chat book was introduced by Alan Williamson, and the last title, while the press was still housed at St. Mary's, uh -huh. 
was the first Latino title. Oh, okay, Stephen. Where at, at that point, you still didn't necessarily have an all-Latino emphasis. It just happened that this was your... So let's look at the full array of... Momotombo 1.0. <laughs> yes. Pre-Latino emphasis, yes, in yeah, which definitely. there happens to be two uh, Latinas and one Latino, um, Stephen Cordova. And this, what, what year did his come out? Let's check. That was, yeah. 2003. Oh, 10 years ago. Yeah. Okay, then you come here. Mm -hmm. Well, I was actually... No, I, I actually came here in 2001, so I was, you know, I'm, I'm oh, actually... Oh, this I'm actually, is actually during your years as a graduate student. Yeah. You're, you're in, continuing with this. In essence, yeah, in essence. Continuing with this and so, Where's the money coming from? Well, the money is still coming from, from small fundraising, uh -huh. uh, but, but checks are being made out to St. Mary's College. Oh, okay. Checks are being, out, being made okay. out to St. Mary's okay. College. Okay. Right. And then it was after Stephen's chapbook, after Stephen's chapbook came out, 2003 is, is a key year because that's the year that I began working at the Institute. Mm. And so at that point, I realized that I had to create a literary program mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. I had this press, which was going to be Latino-centric, yeah. starting with Stephen, but it was housed at St. Mary's. Mm -hmm. And I thought, no, no, I need, to bring, I need to bring the press to Notre Dame. So was your decision to convert it to a Latino-centric press, um, was that part of getting hired at Institute for Latino Studies? No, or that no. was a decision that kind of, um, you kind of settled on after Stephen's book came out? I was, I but was. before I, you started working for ILS. Yeah, I was hired, I was hired in, 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 the, in July of 2003, right after I completed my MFA here. Uh -huh. um, there was no okay. literary component to speak of at the Institute. Uh -huh. And so I was charged, in essence, with creating mm -hmm. one. And one of the first things we did was the Andres Monteo Poetry Prize. But then after Stephen's chapbook came out, then I realized, okay, I, the way I thought of it was, at that time, Momotomo Press was a hobby. Mm -hmm. So the idea was to, to convert that hobby into part of my job. Mm -hmm. Right, to, right. Yeah, into part of my job. Yeah, to integrate and, these parts of your life. And so that meant uh, to bring the press to Notre Dame. And so two things had to happen. One, I had to uh, pitch the idea to my immediate supervisor at the time, mm -hmm. and then we jointly had to pitch the idea to Gil Cardenas, mm -hmm. and then he had to sign off on that. That was the first thing that had to happen. Mm -hmm. The second thing that had to happen, which is actually a, a real key, key thing, is that I had to figure out a way to fiscally house the press mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. And so I managed, and to this day I don't remember exactly how I managed, <laughs> <laughs> but I managed to speak to someone in development who agreed to create an account mm. for Momotombo Press. Oh, okay. That was the, the excuse, the excuse. Uh -huh. the excuse to create an account in development where checks would be made out to Notre Dame was specifically for the press. Wow. But then as Letras Latinas began to grow, uh -huh. that account became a Letras Latinas Oh, okay, account. okay. And you ended up fundraising? Fundraising for... Into that account yeah. for your public programming, your programming in schools. So Momotombo Press allowed me to create an account uh -huh, with, right. with the development. Right. And so whenever I'd get checks... I'd walk them over to Donna Snyder, and she would she would uh, deposit them. Huh. So Mumbo Tumba Press, in, fa in essence, allowed Letras Latinas to become f a fiscal entity in, in many respects. Right, and Letras Latinas today is the literary division of ILS that includes the the chapbooks. Book well, when, prizes. when Mumbo Tumba Press was still up and running, it included the it, it included the press, it uh -huh. included the book prizes, uh -huh. it included. And, and, but Boetes, lots of public programming. Poetas y Pintores included. Yes, y our, our collaboration um, with St. Mary's. So once I decided to bring the press to Notre Dame, then of course the next question became, who will be uh, the next author? Uh -huh. And this actually brings up an interesting discussion when we start talking about this, this, this book. Oh, Lisa, right, so, that's right. So yeah. Lisa Gonzalez, as you recall, was our colleague at UC Davis. Uh -huh. It's interesting how these Davis connections continue. Yes. <laughs> and so shortly after I began working here, um, Lisa Gonzalez enrolled in the creative writing program 
Oh, okay. Here at Notre Dame. To about 2003. I'm going to say... Maybe 2002. No, because no, we, weren't, we, we weren't here. I, I, I was already working at the ILS. Okay. So let's see. When this came out, she was a student here. So this came out in 2004. Okay. So she, she may have been in her first year here, and I was already working here for a year. Okay. Uh-huh. But the interesting thing about this chapbook is that I remember I was always a big admirer of Lisa's work, but it never occurred to me that she would consider herself a Latina writer. And one time we were having a conversation, and she just brought it up, and she said, uh -huh. well, can I, can, couldn't I publish a Momotone book? Yes, yeah, she did. And I said, well, do you consider yourself a Latina writer? And she sort of you know, said, well, let's see, I was born and raised in California. Um, uh, the first writer who spoke to me in any sub substantive way was Sandra Cisneros. Mm -hmm. All my best friends were Chicana. I was subjected to the same racial epithets that they were. Mm -hmm. I come from a big Catholic family. Yes. And she's ethnically Portuguese, so in California, you wouldn't find a generation or two behind us anyone ethnically Portuguese aligning themselves with Chicanos and yeah. So <laughs> actually, Latino population. So I actually, when she when she said that, I I, I thought what I, I thought uh, yeah, I'd like to publish you. Uh -huh. Publish you. And this is just distinct from what came before in another way in that it's prose. Exactly, yeah. This is our first prose title. And I'm very proud uh, of this chapbook for a couple of reasons. We, we were able to get a beautiful introduction by Elena uh -huh. Maria Viramontes. And the other thing I'll say about this is that this was designed, one of the things about being at Notre Dame, one of my, my cohorts here was a, a Filipino poet named Charles Valley. And while we were here, we, st we started an, uh, a journal, a student journal here called Danta. Mm. You remember I remember that, Danta. yeah, which so is he would, Irish he, for poetry. He taught, right? himself, he taught himself book design. And so uh, for the next several titles, in fact, uh, Charles Valley became, became the official designer of Momotumba Press. Oh, okay. And so this was his first design effort, your first prose chapbook. And, and, and look who, bl who blurbed Lisa's chapbook. Well-known Portuguese-American writer, Catherine Vaz. Catherine Vaz uh -huh. and M. Evelina Galang. Uh -huh. Evelina Galang, yeah. And then, of course, once the press was housed at Notre Dame, visually anyway, we had to sort of come up with a new logo. And so the logo is the sunburst, the, the ILS sunburst with the silhouette of the volcano uh -huh. embedded. So we went from the simple line, the line, drawing. line drawing. That's right. Of the press of the of the volcano's silhouette, to to the sunburst. Kind of combining yeah. it with the ILS logo, yeah. And I guess the other thing I would say is that choosing to publish Lisa brought to the fore this whole question of who's Latino, who's mm -hmm. not Latino, because actually choosing to publish her, I remember caused a little caused a few raised a few eyebrows. And in fact, I remember yes. asking asking someone for a blurb and that person declining to blurb Lisa right. because she wasn't a real Latina. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I wanted to start thinking of those controversies and those interpersonal conflicts because they make such good stories. Um, <laughs> um, and the more, you know, the more time goes by, the more good work you do. Haters be hating. The more, the more there, the more there is, you know, occasion to talk about what should have happened or what didn't happen. And so many people like to have an opinion about something they're not involved in. But would you say this was the first? This was the first sort of momotombo controversy, or the first time you encountered a less than pleasant experience as a publisher in that dialogue about uh, about being criticized for having published a Portuguese writer. Was that the first time you felt like, oh, it's getting a little lonely at the top? <laughs> I think, I think, I think, yeah, I, uh -huh. think, I think you're right, yeah, uh -huh. yeah, I, I would say, yeah. I mean, it, it wasn't, it, it just made me aware, it made me aware, in some ways, that, that, that the publication of that chapbook was a cross, was a fork in the road. Right. In terms of the, the publishing philosophy, and also the whole debate about Latinidad as well. Yeah. Is it, are we, go, I'm going to go down, what do I believe? Do I, do, I, do I err on the side of inclusion right. or err on the side of exclusion? And so that and was... So that was my, that was when I decided, yeah, I err on the side of in, yeah, inclusion. That was you standing on the side of inclusion. And in fact, your early experience being published in a chapbook series reflected that inclusion as well because it was the Chicano chapbook series, which may I, or may not 
be an inclusive sort of pan-American identity. I remember, I'm glad you brought that up because one of the things that we did, uh, at some point, I don't remember when, it might have been in 2006 when we were well into our, our trajectory, um, we did an interview. I did an online interview with Gary Soto mm. to talk about the history of the Chicano Chapbook series mm -hmm. in, in more detail. And I remember specifically asking them, so Gary, why, why did you publish me? Mm -hmm. Because as you know, I'm not... I'm not Chicano. Uh -huh. And his response was, he used an interesting term, he said, oh, but you're Rasa. Uh -huh, uh -huh. You're Rasa, yeah. you grew up in the Mission District. And that was his inclusive conception. Yeah, yeah. right, you grew, grew up in the Mission. and Yeah, yeah much like Lisa's self-conception. Well, I grew up in California, in these you know, Latino communities, and, yeah. or with, at least with Latino peers. All right, so here's a material question. So here's a fly leaf. This is a nice gold fly leaf. And here's a blue one. <laughs> um, who made all of those decisions, and what were your all of the, I think, all of the fine yeah, no, tuning? I, well, design decisions. I would set general parameters. Uh -huh. Like I knew I wanted a fly leaf, and and and, and wanting a fly leaf <laughs> goes back to our experience with Swanside Press. Uh huh. I uh huh. And then and then I would just tell the designer. That I want a fly leaf, and the designer would then would this, pick the colors. Would pick the colors oh, and, yeah, and run, run things by me, but but, oh. but primarily, I just knew that I wanted a fly leaf because I just thought fly leaves were nice. So this is Charles, as your designer, mm -hmm. and this one's also Charles. Yes. Oh, okay. All right. Yes. Should we move on to Brenda, or do you yeah. want to talk about Momo Tombito in the meantime? Let's move on to Brenda. Move on we, to we, Brenda. Is this your first Midwestern writer? That might be the first one. Well, to... although Lisa lived in the Midwest when hers came out, but she's a Californian. <laughs> I'm trying to remember how I how I do you remember because you you I edited Brenda. Brenda. I did. I this was but the I first I'm one. But I'm trying to remember why why Brenda even. Uh, be... How you first met her? I think no. I think what happened with Brenda. Here's what happened with Brenda. Uh -huh. I'm remembering it now. Let me just see the, the the year. So one thing to perhaps mention to talk about context. Yeah. So in 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 the summer of 2004. I was putting together the proposal for the wind shifts, and I remember In that the I needed. Of 2004. Okay. And I remember that I needed some Latinas from the Midwest. Oh, okay. And I discovered Brenda Cardenas's edited volume. I forget what it's called. It was uh -huh. co published by Carlos Cumpian's yeah. Marcha Brasso Press. And she was living in Chicago. She was living at in the Chicago. Time. It was yeah. co-edited by her and Johanny Vasquez Bas. That's right. And from that anthology, I sort of plucked Brenda, Vanessa Fuentes, who lives out in Minneapolis, uh -huh. and then I contacted Brenda to get work from her mm -hmm. for The Wind Shifts. Mm -hmm. And it was that experience of reading her work for The Wind Shifts that made me think I want to do a chapbook of her work. Uh -huh. And oh, so that's how, that's how Brenda became a Momotumbo. So her book came out in 2005. Yeah. And the wind shifts eventually came out in 2009. Seven. Seven. Oh, Seven. okay. That was the University of Arizona Press anthology yeah. that you edited. Fifteen. Now, how, Latino do you remember how, how you came to be the editor of this volume? Um, I think that you just were at a time where um, your roles were expanding through Letras Latinas here, and you, you thought um, it might be nice to have some... Um, some help to have a right hand gal, I think, was that you were your plate was getting very full as I as I recall. And I was in South Bend by then, I think is the other significant note. By then, um, I had ended up in South Bend as well, to my delight, working so what year across did you, the what, street. What, from, year, what year did you get to South Bend? Um, two thousand and three. I became okay. a faculty fellow with the Center for Women's Intercultural Leadership across the street at St. Mary's. You were already here, mm -hmm. uh, here at Notre Dame, and so that was a nice chance to reconnect. And What do you remember about editing Brenda's manuscript? Um, we spent a lot of time on the phone, I remember. We spent a really? lot of time on the phone, and there were... Um, I was probably a little saucier then, I think. <laughs> um, we, she had sent a book length. She had sent me at least one book length manuscript from which I could pull different poems and some mm -hmm. of the poems I pulled didn't include some that she had been reading for years and years that had gone over well with live audiences and um, sometimes we would have to agree to disagree on what should be in there but more often than not she was um, amenable to some of my 
suggestions. I had I was very hands on. I had a lot of changes that I had suggested to her, and a lot of reordering, and a lot of questions for her about how did this work and why did this work. And I think I brought, um, I, of course, my own preferences to the work too. <clears throat> the first one here, medicine. I think she never thought of that as a poem that might open the book, but to me, it, it's so heavy on mythology and, of course very lush natural imagery, which mm -hmm. I love, mm -hmm. that I, I advocated it for the first one, and she agreed. So there was it was a very dynamic process, and I definitely did not hold back in terms of my ideas, and for the most part, she was very receptive, and when she wasn't, um, she was comfortable saying that, too. She was comfortable sort of expressing her horror about some of my <laughs> well, ideas. I remember, well, I remember it during that, because sometimes you would, we would email. Yes, and, and we I would debrief. One of the things I remember was that she would have a poem, for example, that Juan Felipe Herrera liked a lot. Right. And, and that would so that would be her, her reason for wanting to include it or right. and then you didn't I would say something cheeky to you like, Well, Juan Felipe Herrera is not your editor <laughs> 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 That was just us debriefing. <laughs> I never said that to her face, but how did, sorry, how, Brenda. <laughs> how did um how did we decide to um include these woodcuts by What's his name? Is it, is that was a friend of hers, I think. I think she had been kind of... Jeff Abby Maldonado. Linocuts. Yeah, she, I think, had been involved with some of the galleries in Chicago, in particular Mexican Fine, Fine Arts, Arts Museum. Fine Arts Museum, in yeah. Yeah, in Pilsen. I think she had been involved with some of the um, art scene, the uh, Chicano art scene, and wanted to include those. That was her idea. And I suppose we should say that... Uh, this, from the tongues of brick and stone, was was introduced by Maurice Kilwin Guevara, um, and blurred by Demetria Martinez and Juan Felipe. I think this is a good moment to also begin to to talk about because I think this title and the next two, meaning these two, were probably the titles. Uh, we'll say what, what they were: Br tongues from the brick and stone poetry, Malinche's daughter. Nonfiction by Michelle Otero with an introduction by Lisa D. Chavez, uh, and Pepper Spray. Back to poetry by Paul Martinez Pompa and introduced by Luis Rodriguez. These three titles were probably the three titles that were most adopted in classrooms. Oh, okay. They and, and they sold. I mean, I, uh -huh. I kept getting. Brenda that, sold out. Brenda sold out, uh -huh. but it was it sold out because it was getting adopted. It was getting adopted. And that's from a run of three hundred. No, these are five hundred uh -huh. now. Actually, no, let me tell you, yeah, Brenda. Yeah, these are this. This was five hundred. Uh -huh. This was uh -huh. five hundred, and they were selling so well. This one, this this was a thousand. No kidding. And this one actually went into a second printing huh. because it was selling so well. Yeah. Uh, and true. Paul's was five hundred, and it sold out, mm -hmm. and it was being so. I found myself. Oftentimes, filling out book orders, uh -huh, uh -huh. And, and 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 that began. I began to realize that that I probably needed more help because uh -huh. I found myself a lot. A lot of my time was spent filling, yeah. filling out book orders. And the nice thing about um, Michelle Otero's collection of nonfiction, it sold so, and she was really good about pushing it. Mm -hmm. She gave tons of readings. And she was actually able to get her Harvard classmates to bankroll the second printing. Mm. Yeah, and she, I should, I suppose, we should also say, I should say, that Michelle Otero's collection, uh, her work, was brought to my attention by Richard Yanez. Oh, okay. Yeah. Who had been at St. Mary's across the street from 2000 until 2003. Yeah. Yeah. And Paul's work like Brenda's work, uh, came to my attention uh, because of the work I was carrying out for the Institute, in this case specifically the Andres Montoya Poetry Prize. Mm. Paul's submitted a full-length manuscript to the first edition of the prize, mm. and that's how I first became acquainted with his work. Oh, okay. And so I, uh, so the first, the first edition of the prize was in 2004. Uh -huh. The book came out in 2005. And so he immediately became a candidate, not only for the wind shifts, but also for, uh, for the for the press. Oh, okay. And I would say that I and would put. And he's in Chicago. And he's in Chicago as well. And 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 I would put uh, Kevin A. Gonzalez in the same category. Mm -hmm. Kevin A. Gonzalez also submitted a full-length manuscript 
to the first edition of the Andres Montoya Poetry Prize. Oh, okay. So that made him a candidate for the wind shifts and also um, Momotombo Prize. Okay. In, in particular, after they didn't necessarily win that competition, exactly. but then they still had this unpublished manuscript that you had significant interest in. Yeah. Are, you st is, are these all the same designer, Charles? These are all Charles. Okay. These are all Charles. Yeah. 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 I like this one. <laughs> I like the, this one strikes me as hearkening back to those chapbooks from the 60s. I think what we were trying to go for there was to sort of... A playbill. A playbill yeah. of a boxing, of a boxing yeah. match. Yeah, it's great. I love it. Yeah. And this one, of course, was introduced by Ter <coughs> Terrence Hayes. Uh-huh. And blurb by Jim Daniels. And, and Paul's chapbook was introduced by uh, Luis, Luis Rodriguez. That's right. That's right. Wow, that's a lot of work. And yet you kept going. <laughs> um, I suppose I could say something about Momotombito before, before we before Yeah, we before get to we the wind, closing wind act. Yeah. yeah. So um, one time I was wandering through the stacks here at Hesburgh Library. Uh-huh. In fact, I'm just going to... I was wandering through the stacks of Hesburgh Library, and I came across a little chapbook that was published by... Robert Haas. In fact, I include that here. Hmm. Yeah. I don't think I remember hearing about that. Oh, yeah, it was Robert Haas. I said, so, okay, let me, just, let me just see if I can say this. Say this. I'll just say it. Yeah. Uh, when John Mathias expressed interest in publishing something with Momotombito, an informal imprint of Momotombo Press, I couldn't help but feel honored. Unbeknownst to him at the time, his two poems, an eight-page chapbook printed in England in 1997, which I discovered in the stacks of Hesburgh Library, had, with its simple gray cover, served as a model for the design of In Praise of Cities, mm. the inaugural volume of this imprint. One of his two poems is dedicated to Bob Haas, the Bay Area-based writer who, as it happens, was the first contemporary poet I read as a senior in high school oh. in San Francisco. Huh. And so that experience, um, for these, for, you know, that experience um, made me think that I could create this space, Momotombito, for two kinds of gestures. One is to publish something by someone who doesn't mind paying the bills mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but who wants something but who does not want to outright self so it's a form of self publishing mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. you are paying you're paying the bills mm -hmm. but within this creative within, space within an imprint that yeah, you which was what this was oh that's and, the John Matthias book yeah. okay but i am not but the second the second gesture was for those people who had no qualms about paying the bill even for themselves. Uh -huh. so, Momo, so In Praise of Cities was uh, a gesture that I did on, on, on the heels of 9-11. Mm. Um, th there are three poems. One is a newer poem about 9-11. About mm -hmm. And I decided to foot the bill myself. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and again, I was being inspired by the things that we've talked about before. Mm -hmm. Small Press Publishing, Pepper Canister Press, um, so I created this, mm. and then once I created this, I remember giving a copy of it to John Matthias and mm -hmm. him really liking it. Um, and then he's the one who approached me about doing this, mm. and I had to reiterate to him, but you, you know that you have to, you have to pay for it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, that's fine. and you knew him already through. And John Matthias was my first poetry teacher here mm. at Notre Dame. Okay. And and I think I mentioned the Bob Hass connection because he, Bob Hass. Robert Pinsky, James McMichael, and John Peck were cohorts at Stanford in the late 60s, hmm. and they all studied together under, wow. under Ivory Winters. Huh. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Interesting. And the, like anything, one of the things, you know, one of the things that you'll, you'll see that on the, in the back of the first one I, I write here, it just goes to show that sometimes you, you, you have projects in mind that don't come to pass. Yeah. I have here, in Praise of Cities, the inaugural chapbook of Momotombito, 
And then I have a little paragraph here that says Chicano writer Richard Yanez is the next author slated for publication. Oh, yeah. The Mo Momotombito series. His first uh, yes. collection of stories, El Paso del Norte, will be published in 2003. So we were going to do a Mambo Tombito chat book with Richard Yanez, but I don't remember what happened. Let's do the we were going to do's. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. The ghost <coughs> chat book. This is a good time. That you don't see. The we were going to do's. Yeah. We have two of them. We have three, if you include Rich's, that okay, we don't even right. remember what yeah. the heck happened. Well, Rich happened. is going to be Momo Tombito, right. but let's talk about the first... Right, uh, because this during this period, you bring me on as associate editor. These other books come out. I'm still associate editor. <laughs> <laughs> but no one would know it because no books come out that I've actually edited. So, so, so how, did, how did we... How did we uh, we're talking about G Gabe Gomez, right? Yes, so Gabe Gomez, whose book, The Outer Bands, won the um, Montoya Prize. The second in, Montoya the Prize. The second Montoya Prize in 2000 and The prize would have been held. It would have, you know, he would have won it in 2006. The book would have came out in 2007. Oh, I was way yeah. off. 2007. Yeah. Um, but how did we meet Gabe? He had blind submitted. You, we had had some kind of call somewhere. I don't know. <laughs> we, had, we had a call. <laughs> uh, for submissions somehow, somewhere, and you had a kind of a stack of submissions from folks you didn't know. I think, I know. I think okay, it good. It may have been, good, I don't in, your, in, your, in your condition as associate editor, I gave you a small yes. stack of manuscripts. That you had said, been sort of... Um, and I said, choose one. Yeah. And you you were gonna act, a, I think you were going to exercise your associate editorship right. by choosing one. Yeah. And you... Picked Gabe I did. I Gomez. picked. I picked Gabe Gomez. I did. But where did you get that stack? Just from your travels around the country, talking about Momotombo, and people would pass them to you. It you may, it may neither have, of us knew him before. No, no. It may have been him just blind submitting. I think it was him blind submitting because yeah. by then, by then, you have at least some or all of these books, so it was gaining some visibility in the poetry world, and you had the Latino mission. There weren't any other chapbook <coughs> publishers that had a Latino mission at the time. So Gabe Gomez, um, he, I, he is ethnically Mexican-American. Yeah, from, from El Paso. From Texas, that's right. And um, his poetics is more on the non-narrative experimental side. And I did, I selected his, his manuscript and called him up, and it, Katrina had just happened maybe two weeks before, and I saw this um, New Orleans address and phone number. Luckily, it was a cell phone. It was still working. I called him up, and I said, um, this is Maria from Momotomo Press. Yes. <laughs> First of all, are you okay? Yes. And in fact, they had lost everything, but they themselves had, had evacuated and were safe, <coughs> but mm -hmm. uh, he and his wife, and... Um, so then I said, well, I'd like to, we'd like to publish your book. And he, he, of course, he said, well, this is the best news I've had all month. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so I selected some poems, and then we spent a lot of time on the phone, as well as I had with Brenda, um, with me being very hands-on and him also being very willing to just dive back in and revise. I mean, I really have to credit the willingness of these poets to re-examine work that they may have spent time, so much time with already um, through readings and through submissions to magazines. So um, we had a very hands-on process, created a chapbook, created an order. Did we have a title? Um, <coughs> I don't know. It may have been called The Outer Bands. I don't remember because it had some Katrina-focused poems in The Outer Bands, mm -hmm. refers to The Outer Bands of Our Hurricane. Um, so maybe it was called The Outer Bounds. I don't remember. <laughs> But we had the whole thing, we had the order, we had all the revisions sewn up and tied with a bow, and then... And then, concurrently, uh, the second edition of the Andres Montoya Poetry Prize was underway. Valerie Martinez was the final judge. Um, I would have culled 20 finalist manuscripts mm -hmm. and sent them to her. Mm -hmm. And we were getting around the time where she was going to have to announce who the winner mm -hmm. was. And the interesting thing about it is that when she finally communicated to me that the winner, personally, she communicated to me that the winner was, was Gabriel Gomez, I was slated to go to the Border Book Festival in a couple of weeks. Mm. 
and she was in she was in New Mexico, and I pitched the idea to her. What if we make the official announcement of the winner of the Andres Montero Poetry Prize at the Border Book Festival? Mm-hmm. There was going to be a session there with Emmy Perez, and I was going to be. So that would have been the summer. Of uh, spring, spring. Spring We're talking, of two thousand and seven. Well, the book came out in two thousand and seven. This spring would have been two thousand six. Sp- spring okay. of two thousand and six. Okay. And so here's what we did. So, but but we wanted to let Gabe know, right? Mm-hmm. So we wanted to have an official announcement mm-hmm. of the prize. But we wanted Gabe, obviously, to know. Mm-hmm. So I had Gabe's cell phone number. Uh-huh. We're in the parking lot. We're walking to the session where we're going to make the announcement. Uh-huh. And we call up Gabe on the cell phone. <laughs> and I, and we, I give the cell phone to Valerie Martinez. Uh-huh. And Valerie Martinez uh, lets Gabe know uh-huh. that he's the winner. Wow. And then we go to the session. Uh-huh. And Valerie reads her statement, which eventually became the introduction, the introduction. to the book. Oh, okay. Interesting. And so I guess at that point, I'm not sure when we began to sort of think, oh, God, now what do we do about the moment? I think it was a little awkward because um, I think the concern was that it would just seem... Well, they'd be competing with one another. And yeah, obviously... they would compete, be competing with one another, and <coughs> one might wonder, have you become the Gabe Gomez Society? <laughs> he brought out his chapbook, he brought and out I think, his book. <laughs> I, think, I think we... I, I, I just... I, I don't know if, how I, I just I, we can't do both. In other words, you won the it prize. It just didn't seem like yeah, yeah. It didn't yeah. They they would be competing. They would be sort of parallel gestures. And most of the books in the chapbook were in the book manuscript. So they went on to have a life of their own in his book, The Outer Bands. Um, so now, do you have any graduate student help at this at this point before we go to the final the final titles? Did you have students working for you or no? Other assi- no, just. No. I mean, at that point, you were still the acquiring editor. I, R- R- Rich was an acquiring editor in, in, That's in some right. ways. Because That's right. He helped with... He helped, and he was also, you know, he had a, a project that he was trying to work on, which never came to fruition. I don't, don't even remember. It might have been a former student of his. It uh, was a former student. I remember that. That was another we didn't do. Yes. Yeah. Because she kept revising and revising. And, and it never no, went anywhere. Nothing ever happened. No, we never yeah. got the final manuscript. Yeah. She may still be revising it to this day. But and he I, edited this one. Malinche's daughter. And I should say that we do have one exception here in a sense that the, 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 the mission of Momotoma Press was, was to publish emerging voices, new voices in Latino literature mm-hmm. in the chapbook format. We broke that mold for one title, and that was Braille for the Heart by Robert Vasquez, mm-hmm. introduced by Diana Marie Delgado. Here we have the idea of the mentee introducing the mentor, yeah. poetically speaking. Nice and Blurbed by another mentee, Eduardo mm-hmm. Corral. So Eduardo and Diana both were big admirers of Robert's mm. work. And this was actually an example of an experiment that didn't really bear the fruit that I'd hoped it would. Mm-hmm. And Robert consented to having a chapbook of his work published, and the objective was going to be that this was going to be a, a limited edition chapbook to raise money. Mm-hmm. And I think we published, we printed, I think, like 300 of them. And mm-hmm. the idea is that, was that we were going to sell all 300 for $30 and yeah. make whatever that, whatever that mm-hmm. match is. And it just didn't quite, quite get off the ground. Right. Yeah, it was a limited edition that was a, as a, published as a fundraiser. I remember that, and, and it didn't... And you know, um, nothing ever slowed you down, though. You never said, you know what, uh, if this didn't work, and I'm just so discouraged, so hang it all. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> what do you think? What do you think that was in you that just, if there was a, <coughs> if there was a roadblock, you just would make a slight change in course and keep moving. <laughs> I don't. Well, I mean, by that time, certainly, the fact that this was a fundraiser uh, meant that I was in full swing here at my job at, at Letras Latinas at Notre Dame uh-huh. and that I had to raise money. It was part, uh-huh. of, part of my... That was part of your job, your mandate. It was part of my, job, my, part yeah. of my job so, description. So try, if something didn't work, trying the next thing was a natural part of your, yeah. your uh, professional yeah. station here, basically. Yeah. And the last two titles, before we talk about the final title that wasn't, because that was going to be the final title. The final title, title that wasn't, that's yeah. right. Um, <laughs> well, it's, yeah. So... Scott and Guito. Another back to California. Another yeah, California. Scott and Guito was a really interesting uh, 
relationship in that I was a student here, an, a graduate student at Notre Dame, mm -hmm. and he was applying to MFA programs, mm -hmm. including Notre Dame, and he got accepted, and he mm -hmm. actually came for a campus visit, mm -hmm. but in the end, he ended up going to Iowa, mm -hmm. but he had done his undergraduate degree at San Francisco State, where he studied with D.A. Powell, mm. and he was, along with Rosa Alcala, was one of the two poets who I felt were the more experimental poets of the wind shifts. And hmm. I knew that he had this series called Dear Jack. And I think over time, I decided that I wanted to try to publish a, a more experimental title. And I approached him mm -hmm. about doing a collection. And we had Craig Santos Perez, who's from Guam, mm -hmm. do the the introduction, and D.A. Powell uh -huh. did the blurb. So this ends up being the first title that's more firmly in that experimental tradition. It might have been yeah. Gabe's, but yeah. it ends up being Scott's. Yeah, that's yeah. right. That's right. Yeah. And you say, I yeah, so now let's think about a sort of breadth and depth. So you said, I wanted to publish a more experimental title, so you wanted a kind of a breadth in aesthetics. At some point, we had the gender balance conversation, um, <clears throat> and that was what led us to our final title that wasn't, because... Um, I think we were, we both kind of we were agreed talking. that it was time yeah. to try and reset the, the which numbers. Is, which is interesting because one of the, one of the things that I that I, uh, that I noticed about the Chicano chapbook series was how unbalanced it was. Mm. It was predominantly male, mm -hmm. maybe like Sandra Cisneros and maybe two other people. Mm -hmm. um, and and this one had not not to the same degree, but I began to notice that it was it, listing to one yeah, side. Yeah, it was listing yeah. to one side, and so. <laughs> At some point, we were talking about publishing uh, Pat Mora's daughter. What's her name? Oh, yes, Libby. Libby. Uh -huh. That was another Libby Martinez. possible we were talking That's about. That's right. We were talking about yeah. Libby Martinez. That's right. And yeah. then, I guess, well, this is part of Momotombo's history. When you, went to the, when you went to the Latino Writers Conference in New Mexico. That's right. That's right. We had a, we had a chat book panel. We had a the, chapbook that you panel. You were on. Yes. By then, I had I had managed to bring another book to print. I had. And at the time, we one. didn't know this was going to be our final title. Yes, we, I had just finished editing this one. This one had just come out, so I think I had this one to to, to promote at the conference and was sharing it around. And that's Octavio R. Gonzalez from New York City. And he's a writer that had was put on my radar by Rigoberto Gonzalez. Uh -huh. And one of the things I will say about about Octavio is that he was very good about sending me emails every now and then just to keep me abreast of what what was going on in his writing life. Uh-huh. And he would do it like once or twice a year uh -huh. for a few years. Yeah. And I eventually thought, okay, it's time. Uh -huh. we'll see, we need to do a chapter good. by him. Yeah. And and then I asked you if you would yeah. look at, look at his I work. And I loved editing his book. I thought it was really fun to work on that book. Um, and Rigoberto wrote a Nice, nice introduction. Yeah, he did. Now and so now I'm wondering too. Before we get to the last one that wasn't, <coughs> um, thinking about the idea of balance, and we had a gender balance, and then you wanted to have aesthetic diversity, and you have gay poets and you have straight poets. I wonder if we have religious diversity. I'm not sure. <laughs> um, you have straight women, and we, and we had a lesbian poet scheduled for the end, um, Kathy Arellano. How do, and you met her at the... And I met her at the um, National Hispanic... National Latino, Latino Writers Conference. Oh, okay, at the Hispanic... At the National Hispanic Cultural Center. Cultural Center, Center in, in Albuquerque. Albuquerque. That's right, and I had And the a, context was because you were there for a panel. Yeah, like, yeah. And, I, and they set me up with little 20-minute consult slots, and so anyone could sign up to have a consult with the acquiring editor from Momotomo Press, which was a <laughs> kick because... <laughs> because it was just me. <laughs> Um, and so she brought her manuscript, and of the ones that, that I saw there, I was most impressed with hers. And, and I was also touched by her se sense of place, her place rootedness. She grew up in the mission, and a lot of her poems were about having li lived through the first wave, maybe, of gentrification mm -hmm. in the mission, where yeah. established families couldn't afford their rent any longer or were getting evicted because their units were getting converted to upscale condos. And, um, and you grew up in the mission, so I, I sort of thought, oh, I bet Francisco will be pleased that we have a writer who's really emphasizing this 
cultural history yeah. of the mission. Um, so I really liked that sense of place that she had in being from the San Francisco Bay Area myself. And so you worked with her, right? Yeah, I, I said, let's let's do this book together. Now, are we? did we use contracts at any point? I don't think... We did not because we just never got around we to just that never level got around of to formalizing formality. it. Yeah, but right. We never we never got to that level of formality. Right. And up until that moment, that had <laughs> never caused uh, a problem. Yeah. Um, in hindsight, it perhaps c could have avoided some things. Yeah. Um, but it was always sort of just a, to, you know, to use a, a sexist term, a gentleman's agreement. Right. <laughs> <laughs> a smile and a handshake would get you a chapbook. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so I'm smiling about it now because the whole thing fell apart at, at some point or another. But we got as far as um, having created two chapbooks. Mm -hmm. We created one together where I suggested selections and she suggested modifications. And we had started editing. We had been through one pass of edits. And she withdrew that whole thing and said, I've completely reconceived my work. I really want to, instead of option A, I want to do option B that has distinct thematic emphases. Will you please look at this instead? So then I got a new batch of poetry and looked at that new batch and we worked together to um, create the conception of a chapbook for option B. Mm -hmm. And um, Shuri Moraga was set to write the introduction. And I think she wrote it. I don't think we ever had quite gotten it from her. I don't think she ever wrote it. I never saw it if she wrote I it. I think I'm gonna have to check. Yeah. But there may, so, it may or may not have, it had an introducer if not an introduction. Yeah, I think she wrote it because I do know we eventually got a cover. Uh -huh. and it, was a, it, was a, it was an image of a photograph that she took yes. of Mission the High School. The cover was designed. Mission the High selections School. were made. The I last also, edits were in the process. I also remember, and this is one of the things that, you know, as, as we wind, that, wind down, I do remember the experience of, of choosing, choosing the cover. Mm -hmm. And, and that was, there was a lot of back and forth, and I sort of had to let her know that, you know, this is our, the, the, that, this part of the process is the mm -hmm. publisher's domain. Mm -hmm. Um, because she was suggesting many different covers. Mm -hmm. But we had a, ended, ended up a really beautiful cover of Mission High School. Mm -hmm. And by that time, the designer was a guy named Chris, Chris Shackman. Um, yes. Which was his first title? This one. Yeah. Wasn't it? No. You know what? I just realized something, and I'm glad I remembered right now. We actually have, we're actually missing a title. Oh. Yeah. Aaron Morales. Aaron Morales, the fiction writer. Oh, gosh. Which also sold out, didn't it? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, it didn't sell out. <laughs> there was high hopes for it selling oh, out. Oh, okay, okay. But anyway, Aaron, it was Aaron Morales who, who brought us on to the, to the last uh, designer. Oh, okay. But we should say that, yeah, Aaron Chris Morales... Chris Jackman's yeah, yeah. first book with Momo yeah, Tongo. Yeah. But Aaron Morales wrote a fiction chat book, which was actually an excerpt from his novel... Um, That's right. Drowning in Tucson, right. I believe, which yep. was published by Coffee House Press, and it was actually oh, okay. it was a beautiful chapbook. Yes. Uh, for some reason, I, I I didn't find a copy of it, although I do have copies in, in my office. That's in right. So that was two chap two fictions, one yeah. nonfiction, and the rest poetry. That was close. We almost we almost one did. memoir basically is yeah. uh, Michelle's yeah. is memoir. So we had this beautiful that cover. Close. We, had, <laughs> we had this beautiful <laughs> cover of Mission High School. Um, yes, we had a cover. And I think what happened was, and this gets back to the contractual issue. Well, before we get, let's delay the, let's delay the, the mystery one more moment and say, by now we knew this would be the last one. That's right. That's right. We, yeah, we, we were going to, we were going to, we knew the we time gonna, had come. All things had their season. This had had it. And it seemed like a nice place to end, given that it was going to be about the mission district. And would it have been the 10th? title that, in the Latino mission, I think perhaps. That I don't remember. Yeah. We can we actually, can let's see, <laughs> one, two, three, four, <laughs> don't remember five, six, seven, eight. Nine and Aaron. Nine, Aaron, ten. So it would have been eleven. It would have been eleven? Yeah, okay. Yeah. So maybe we weren't counting um, Robert Vasquez because I had it in my head. Possibly. Of course, he's Chicano, but his was a special edition for That's fundraising. True. So it would have been our tenth. It would have been our tenth of, of the mission. Regular standard Momotomo publishing. <clears throat> it was going to work to recant the uh, or reset the not recant but reset the gender balance, 
It was going to be someone with ties to your hometown. Do you remember the title? Our fr- probably our first lesbian writer. Um, what title did we get? I it? don't remember because it changed a couple times. I was really excited about the work, and it had alternating prose and poetry, which was a nice, That's also right. a nice. It was multi genre. Yeah, multi genre, a nice um, turn. Before we close out, I should say the Aaron Morales' chat book was From Here You Can See the End of the Desert. That's right. And it had a beautiful introduction by Luis Alberto Urea. Yes, that was a really nice introduction. Yeah. Yeah. So there we have Kathy's cover. We have her introducer selected. We have a selection. We're in the last round of edits. And what would you describe happened next? Well, I think what happened was... Well, no, not what I think. So she sent me what she felt was a version of, a, of an agreement, a contract for mm-hmm. whatever it's worth. Mm-hmm. And there were certain things that she wanted. That she had generated. Yeah. Like this document. It was, okay. yeah. Uh-huh. And so uh, I, I basically went point by point and accepted some things, even improved some things in categorically. In her favor. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and in other cases uh, said, no, this is not the domain of the author, this mm-hmm. is the domain of the publisher. Mm-hmm. And so... In essence, I um, sent the revi- a revised contract back to her, mm-hmm. which, in my view, improved um, the conditions, mm-hmm. but uh, she withdrew. That's right. She withdrew. Yeah, rather yeah. than continue negotiations. Yeah. Um, and, that, and, then we, and then we said, well, should we try to replace it? Should we... We talked about Libby Martinez, who is a, a, a good writer. She yeah. lives in Colorado Springs. I live in Pueblo. She's Pat Mora's daughter, but she's also, you know, she has her own identity as a writer. And then we sort of realize, we're tired. <laughs> <laughs> we're tired. Wasn't that, is that an accurate sort of description? Yeah. I'm sure there's a brighter note you can put on it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I just felt at that point that the, the, the publishing bug had run its course. Uh-huh. Because even and by, by then, then, even by then, my role was publisher, not editor. Uh-huh, uh-huh. I was sort of paying the bills, yeah. and other people were doing the editing. And you had a, a good, solid, at least dozen other projects going by then. Probably. Yeah, <laughs> if not two yeah. dozen. So, yeah. <laughs> um, and I by then was editing a, a periodical. I was editing Pilgrimage magazine that came out three times a year. So we were both stretched pretty thin, probably, for time. Um, yeah, I, and, I, and I think I, I felt like uh, projects of this nature have their natural life cycle. That's right. You know? That's right. Just like kind of chapbook series. Didn't last forever, but was impactful yeah. while, it, while it was here. And one of the most gratifying things about a lot of the writers that we published, because the mission was to publish writers who did not yet have a full-length book. Right. That's important to remember. As a, as I don't a, think we mentioned that. As a boost yeah. to them. That was, mm-hmm. it was, that, the, the, the niche was very specific writers who did not yet publish a full-length book. Definitely. So we forgot to mention that Paul Martinez Pompa went on to win mm-hmm. the Andres Montoya Poetry Prize. That's right. The next time he entered. Brenda Cardenas went on to publish her first book, Boomerang, with um, Bilingual Press, mm-hmm. the Canto Cosa series that I edit. Which you, yeah, I edit. Mm-hmm. Um, Kevin A. Gonzalez went on to publish his first book with Carnegie Mellon mm. Press. Stephen Cordova went on to publish his first book with Bilingual Press, with bilingual. which was also part of the Canto Mundo series. And were anyone else? Um, I think that, that's it in terms of people who went on to publish. I think so. Yeah. Um, was Did Aaron? Yeah, Aaron, yeah, it was Aaron, Aaron's book. Aaron, Aaron, Aaron Michael yeah. Morales went on to publish his novel with, with um, Coffee House Press. And me. That's right. <laughs> I went on... To publish with University of Arizona. And Eric Goodis went on to win a, a, yes. a first book prize in California. I, That's right. I believe. That's right. So, mission accomplished. <laughs> Wouldn't you say? I, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> not the, what do you think? Not the firm answer I was expecting. We ha- Can I tell about our, our, sure. our witness? We have our friend Blas Falconer <laughs> here off camera. <laughs> As that our was, witness. Well, we had him here <laughs> in case prompter. in case we got into any awkward silences. He was, was going <laughs> to leave. Didn't happen. Didn't happen. He was going to lob some Did, softball yes, questions. Yes, that's right. Did you have something that you thought we didn't cover? I wrote several questions down, and you answered them all. The last one I had, which I wasn't sure of your answer, is so what made you decide to, 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 to end? To wrap it up, yeah. 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 
Yeah. Did you an- I think you answered it. Yeah. Briefly. I guess it's, you know, we were intending to end it with, with, with Kathy's chapbook. Uh-huh. So, we, so in that sense, we decided we were going to end it. It just turns out that it, it ended with, with, with hobbies instead. So t- tabio, tabio. takeaways, life lessons, deep insights. So one of them <laughs> yes. that I think we both came away <coughs> from uh, was distilled in this conversation you had with Tree Swenson. And Tree Swenson introduced a new, co- a new term to you. She, didn't she say something like, there's a difference between publishing and privishing? <laughs> yes, yes. Do you want to t- talk about some of your takeaways? Some of your well, life lessons? <laughs> um, it's, it, her, her, her term, privishing, what happens when you privish, if I remember correctly, is that you actually produce the physical book, but then if you don't have an infrastructure in place to it disseminate in your closet. it, yeah. it sits in boxes. Right. And I would say that it's been a mixed bag with Momotombo Press, mm-hmm. and a lot of it has had to do with how active the authors were That's right. in promoting their books. That's right. So there were cases of authors who promised to, pu- to really push, and that promise fell short. Uh-huh. There were cases of authors who really went above and beyond, probably... And, yeah. I, and I have no qualms about saying this, the, the person who, who, who went above and beyond. Brenda. Brenda, but also but Michelle Otero. Remember her? And Michelle. Her, mm-hmm. We did 2,000 print runs. Yeah, that's pretty significant <laughs> for a small press. Yeah. Uh, and she sold out both print runs. Uh huh. And, and Brenda, and Brenda and Paul did great in the sense that their books got adopted by, in classrooms. Uh huh. Uh-huh. I think that, that was really That was yeah. important. Yeah. 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 And there were other authors who. who, who this is something that's perennial, you know, perennial in poetry, poetry publishing, that if the author doesn't go, get out there and push the book, yeah, it, it can it can languish. Right. Yeah. That's true. That we just found that as a cold hard truth, and often I've heard graduate students kind of have this nail biting anxiety of, oh, if I can't do the promotion thing, or if I can't get into PoBiz, I'll never get anywhere. And uh, fundamentally, it's it's you know dazzling work that gets advanced and that gets you know, gets those wheels turning on a, on, a, on a writer's visibility on the one hand. On the other hand, we ended up that we couldn't ignore whether we thought someone could promote a book or not. So that by, the, <coughs> by these last three or four titles, we would have conversations during the acquisition phase. Well, do you think this person can give a reading? <laughs> do you think this person can go out and seek... Um, Readings. S- yeah, I sort of stir their own pot. And if yes, then that was taken into consideration. Because we didn't have the resources. Because we didn't have the resources. And not that we... This was taken into consideration after we had found work that we liked. After we found work that we were excited about. Sometimes beginning poets worry that there's all this crappy work out there getting visibility just because someone knows how to do a Facebook post or something. And that's not true. It's that that there's so much good work competing with each other. That, that the only sort of factor that can set one above the fray of many excellent, you know, contemporary titles is, are you willing to build an audience yourself? And we would, we would have to be, have those explicit conversations by the end of it. Not at the beginning, I don't think. I, don't, I think we just thought, let's give it a yeah. try with the early ones. And you were very trusting of us, of the five of us. You, you, you early on said to the five of us in an email, in the Mark My Words, you said, well... This is your book now, so I'm trusting you to promote it and, and get some readings. And so I think that that, that that bore fruit through the rest of the Momotombo. Anytime that did happen, those were the books that, that did well. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Publishing versus privishing. I guess that's a wrap, isn't it? That's a wrap. Right. Well, thank you for doing this. This was fun. <laughs>